Why are we talking about HIV resistance this morning in a treatment session? What is so important about HIV resistance? Well, we know that an increase in HIV resistance equals an increase in AIDS-related deaths, which also e equals an increase in new infections as well as antiretroviral treatment costs. And in fact, some modeling has been done using sub-Saharan African data that showed that when pre-treatment NNRTI resistance was above 10%, this would contribute a 16% AIDS-related death cases of 890,000 individuals, 9% of new infections at 450,000 individuals, and an increase in antiretroviral treatment costs of 8% at a whopping $6.5 billion. So it's easy to see that definitely HIV resistance has the potential to impact the 1990-90 targets that is set. And it definitely has the potential of impacting the target goal of eliminating AIDS, the AIDS pandemic by 2030. So the discussion points I'm going to cover today are what is HIV drug resistance for everyone that is new to the topic that might be sitting in the audience. And then I'm going to be delving into the study data, um, looking at the current state and focusing on adult HIV drug resistance. I'm going to be talking about pre-treatment -treat, pre HIV drug resistance patterns, resistance associated with first-line failures, second-line failures, and then just touching on some third-line outcomes. So very quickly, I don't want to spend too much time because I'm watching the timer. Um, I'm going to be discussing resistance linked to your NRTIs and NNRTIs, which basically target the reverse transcription of the virus. I'll be touching on resistance linked to the integrase inhibitors, examples of Tegravir and Dolutegravir, that target the integrase enzyme and the integration of the viral DNA into the host DNA. And then I'm going to be talking about resistance associated with your protease inhibitors. I've listed there your boosted lipinavir, boosted atazanavir, and boosted darinavir that we use in Africa. Okay, just added these extra class of drugs because I know you might be hearing a bit about them hopefully in this conference. I think monoclonal antibodies we discussed yesterday. Uh, there are also capsid inhibitors um, under development and maturation inhibitors. So always good to know the new classes that are emerging. So how does HIV resistance occur? So there's two factors that contribute to the development of drug resistance mutations, and that is one, the fact that HIV has a high replication rate, and two, the fact that HIV uses an enzyme called reverse transcriptase that has no proofreading ability, right? So just like when we're typing our Word documents these days, we don't really pay attention, at least I've started to forget how to spell things, and normally, the word processor is able to underline that we've made a mistake, go back, correct it. With this um, enzyme, there's nothing telling it that it's incorporated the incorrect nucleotide. And it has a misincorporation rate of every 5,000 to 7,000 nucleotides that are polymerized, it adds the wrong nucleotide. And this causes the potential generation of a resistance mutation. So, that means that if we can target the replication of the virus, we can basically do away with the, resist the development of resistance mutations. But unfortunately, there's a couple of causes of therapy failure. These include toxicity, drug-drug interactions, poor adherence, insufficient antiretroviral pot potency, and insufficient antiretroviral uh, drug levels. And all of this can lead to the development of HIV drug resistance. So it's quite important to understand the HIV viral dynamics and how resistance fits into all of this, how it works, um, especially if you're considering starting to do HIV drug resistance. Um, I've revised some of the uh, Ghana guidelines, and I see that resistance isn't included in your guidelines here. So this will be something interesting for you to see when you start testing, when is the right time to test. So typically a patient will present um, like the I'm going to try to use this pointer there. At the beginning of the slide with lots of sensitive virus, basically, right? I've got two different colors of green there because, remember, the reverse transcriptase enzyme is making mistakes, so you have a quasi-species virus with different mutations present. You then have your patient start treatment. This causes the virus to hopefully suppress, right? It targets the replication of the virus, and you get what's referred to as the bottleneck effect. 
but because of the reasons we discussed previously, you can get the emergence of a resistant virus. Now, if your patient had to go off their treatment, if they had to stop taking their treatment, what you see over time is the re-emergence of your sensitive virus. And the reason for this is that the sensitive virus is always the fittest virus. It replicates extremely efficiently. And there is a consequence when the virus acquires a resistance mutation that there is the possibility that that mutation will cause the virus to have a decrease in its viral fitness, right? There are exceptions to rule with some mutations um, lingering for longer and having quite good viral fitness. Okay, so depending where your patient is in this viral dynamic, it depends on when you will do your resistance testing, or at least you want to target it at the right time. The most important thing is you want your patient taking their RVs. You want the drug pressure there because you want to be able to catch this resistant virus. And doing a resistance test is like taking a photo. You are only seeing what is happening in your patient in that viral population at that time that you're testing. It is not telling you what came before and it's not going to tell you what comes after. It's only at that time. And what you don't want to be doing is testing your patient over here while he's not on his ARVs, where all you'll get is just a very expensive lie detector test coming back to you. Okay, so how do we test for HIV drug resistance? You can do it in one of two ways, phenotypic assays or genotypic assays. The gold standard is to use population-based Sanger sequencing. The limitation of this testing is that it only detects the viral, the resistant virus, when it's there in between 20 to 30% of the entire viral population. So that's its limitation. There are new testing assays available, like next generation sequencing, that are able to go right down to 1%, but we don't know yet what those, the clinical implication is of detecting certain mutations at those low, at those low levels. So basically what we do when we do population-based Sanger sequencing is we get a, a sequence for the virus. We then uh, plug the sequence um, into an algorithm that will compare the sequence to another reference sequence. And this will then tell us what resistance mutations are present. And one of these uh, databases, an example, is the Stanford HIV drug resistance database. And it will also score the drug susceptibility of that resistance mutation. So once you get your report, a lot of times when people see a resistance report for the first time, it looks a lot like gibberish, lots of letters and numbers, right? But it's really very simple. And all we're doing with the mutations, we're just naming the mutations. So if you have your friend today in the audience and they're sitting next to you and they're taking notes for you, and I'm saying, this is how you name a mutation, and they're not paying much attention, and they make a mistake, and they write, this is how you fame a mutation. And I want to describe to you the mistake that your friend has made. I'm going to say the wild type letter, the letter I expect to see in the sentence, is an N for name. But instead, your friend has made a mistake, and now there's an F for fame. So that's the mutant letter. And where did this mistake take place? At letter number 13 of the sentence. So that's all we are saying when we are talking about drug resistance mutations like K103N. We're saying the wild type amino acid, the amino acid I expect to see there is a K. The mutant amino acid, because the reverse transcriptase has made a mistake and added a different nucleotide, it's changed the amino acid, it's now N. And this mistake took place at codon 103 of the RT, of reverse transcriptase. Okay. So that covers the basics of the HIV resistance. For those of you that haven't heard of it before, hopefully you'll follow and understand through my presentation now. So I'm going to be discussing different types of HIV drug resistance. I'm going to start with acquired HIV drug resistance. This refers to resistance mutations that are emerging while patients are taking their ARVs. We're then going to touch on transmitted HIV drug resistance, which refers to resistance mutations that are detected in ARV-naive individuals. And then we're also going to start off with discussing pretreatment HIV drug resistance, which refers to uh, resistance mutations that are detected in individuals before they start their first line antiretroviral treatment. And this includes both individuals that have previous um, exposure to ARVs as well as ARV naive individuals. So what is the prevalence of pretreatment HIV drug resistance currently? So a meta-analysis of adult pretreatment data was conducted by Gupta et al. And it showed that in 2016, 
the level of NNRTI pretreatment resistance was sitting at 11% in Southern Africa, 10.1% in East Africa, 7.2% in West Africa, and 9.4% in Central Africa. This is quite alarming, because back to that first slide where I showed you, we did those calculations, when pretreatment HIV drug resistance is sitting at above 10%, this is the cost of that, right? So already here you had Three countries, one near 10% to above 10% with NNRTR resistance. Then in 2017, the WHO released a very informative HIV drug resistance report, and they illustrated very nicely the trend of increase of NNRTI pretreatment resistance, right? And you can see that there was quite a sharp increase um, the closer we got to 2016. And they estimated that the annual incremental increase of NNRTI pretreatment resistance was 23% in Southern Africa, 17% in Western and Central Africa, and 29% in Eastern Africa. When looking at the prevalence of NRTI resistance, it looked completely different. You can see there weren't major increases. Um, there was an increase um, later towards 2016, but everything basically remained below the critical 10% mark. So the WHO then also conducted a survey looking at uh, data between 2014 and 2016, and they included 10 countries at the time when this re report was re released. There are now a whole host of countries that um, are being surveyed, and hopefully those reports will be coming out soon. But um, in interesting to note on this survey that was that four countries, four African countries were included, and three out of the four had levels above 10% for NNRTR resistance. Even more uh, worrying was the fact that three out of the four countries had transmitted drug resistance levels near or above that critical 10% mark. Okay, taking a closer look at the survey data, we see like in the, um, the analysis that low-level pretreatment HIV drug resistance was low for your NRTIs and your, NN and your PIs. But also, what you, when you look at the specific uh, resistance mutations that were coming up, you'll see that your K103N was the biggest contributor to that NNRTI resistance, followed by your Y181 mutation and your G190 mutation. The other interesting fact that was released in this report was that transmitted drug resistance was two times higher in women than in men, sitting at 12.2% in women and 6.3% in men. And what does that mean? Is that when these women start a first-line antiretroviral NNRTI-based regimen, they're already at a higher risk of failing this first-line regimen. Okay, so what does this mean, having this high NNRTI resistance prevalence when we are using an NNRTI-based first-line regimen in the majority of Africa, right? Is basically we're starting these people on an ineffective um, treatment regimen. Okay, so now looking at resistance data linked to first-line failures, we see quite high levels of resistance in the different regions of Africa. Um, looking at a syst systematic literature review that was conducted, looking at published data for 2014 to 2017, we see that interestingly enough, 30% of patients failing their first line um, had no drug resistance mutation. And because we're not conducting resistance testing after first line failure, these are patients that are poti potentially being switched onto a more expensive second line um, treatment without actually having any drug resistance mutation present. But even more important was the fact that of the 70% of uh, patients that did have uh, drug resistance, half of them had more than two classes of drug resistance, both NNRTI resistance and NRTI resistance, with, as expected, higher levels of NNRTI resistance considering that we have a higher level of NNRTI resistance in pretreatment. So with first-line failures, with, with resistance data from first-line, we, we can already see patterns. We, we already know enough about NNRTI-based first-line failures that we know how resistance will evolve. And the pattern is that you will first see your M184V mutation that's linked to your 3TC or FTC usage. This is followed by the emergence of your NNRTI mutations, which is linked to your favarance or nevirapine. You will see different uh, patterns of mutations depending on whether 
the patient is on a Favarin's or a Nevirapine regimen. And then finally will come your K65R linked to your tenofovir usage and your thymidine analog mutations linked to AZT. So like I said, you can get different patterns. This is just a few examples I put in. Um, in the case of nevirapine, it normally more frequently selects for your Y181C mutation. In the case of efavirenz, you'll see more V106M resistance mutations. And in general, efavirenz selects for a wider range of resistance mutations compared to nevirapine. Also, when looking at comparing D4T to AZT-containing regimens, AZT had a higher frequency for selecting thymidine analog mutations. You also get differences in resistance mutations associated with different subtypes. Does, this does not mean that there is different virulence associated with it. It just means that you will more readily see um, the emergence of one mutation within a specific subtype, and I've just listed a couple of examples there. Okay, looking at first-line resistance data over time, what we see um, with this um, uh, analysis by Mulu is that the level of NRTI and NNRTI resistance as well as dual resistance is definitely on the rise. It's increasing, right? And this is where combining this data with the uh, pretreatment data, it, it's, it's sounding alarm bells that we need to look at an alternative treatment strategy. Okay, looking at resistance linked to your second line options now. Now, Taking into consideration the high levels of NRTR resistance at first-line failure, what does this mean for our second line in Africa where we're using primarily a boosted PI with two NRTIs? So at the time when we saw this data, we asked certain questions and studies have already completed to answer these questions for us. The first question was, can we use a, a boosted lipinavir monotherapy option? Should we use two new classes of drugs? Should we be using a boosted PI with an INST, for example? Um, what would be the potential difference of using raltegravir versus using dolutegravir? And what is the potential difference of using an integrase inhibitor versus, versus a boosted PI? So the second line study, um, which enrolled 97% of their um, subjects had at least one resistance mutation in NRTI or NNRTI mutation at the start of study. And this study showed that there was no, there was no inferiority between a raltegravir-based regimen and a boosted lipinavir-based uh, regimen, second-line regimen. The Ernest study showed that boosted PI monotherapy is a definite no-no. Okay. Um, it was inferior at suppressing the virus, and you did see emergence of uh, protease resistance mutations. What the study also showed was that an integrase-based second line, like the previous study second line, using um, raltegravir was non-inferior to a second line PI-based regimen. And what the study importantly also showed is that the presence of the NRTI resistance, in fact, in the study, um, was equal to better treatment outcome because it was almost a marker to measure adherence, right? Because they had this resistance, the drug pressure was there, and so you saw these higher levels of NRTI resistance, but these were the patients that were um, re suppressing and doing really well. So it became even a measure for um, adherence and also showed that it, irrespective of the NRTI resistance, as long as you had an active boosted PI, it didn't matter the resistance that you had. You just needed to include an NRTI backbone. Okay, so the earnest select and second line studies all showed that integrase based second line with raltegravir was non inferior to a second line PI based regimen. The use of an upfront resistance test to optimize, in other words, to decide which NRTI needs to be utilized, is not required. And then the spring study showed that dolutegravir versus raltegravir is non inferior, while the flamingo study showed that dolutegravir versus boosted darinavir was superior. Okay, looking at second-line resistance over time, a meta-analysis of 649 participants across 13 sub-Saharan studies receiving boosted PI plus two NRTIs. In this study, it showed that more than one-third of patients did not achieve virological suppression and that there were very low levels of PI resistance, a medium of 17%. But what was interesting in this meta-analysis was that we did see an increase of PI resistance mutations over time. 
you know, hinting that the longer a patient is left on a PI, the longer we wait, eventually, potentially, that's when we're going to see the PI resistance. Okay, looking at um, study data from A5288 at their second line resistance patterns, what this study showed us is that, again, 69% of um, the patients enrolled into the study remained susceptible to their second line reg regimen. So potentially they were failing due to treatment intolerability or um, adverse side effects or non-adherence. But the other thing of the, the patients that, were, that did have resistance, what we saw was in a, diverge, a divergent resistant pattern um, that was coming up. So unlike first line where we could predict the evolution of the resistance mutations, we are unable to do that with second line failures. Okay. Conclusions from our second line drug resistance data is that the majority of individuals failing a second line regimen do not have resistance to the regimen. This is changing though with recent data coming out. Um, therefore, we need to find a way to improve our second-line outcome. Studies have shown that resistance testing to optimize NRTI selection does not impact on outcome, and adherence remains the main leader to treatment failure, although we are starting to see an increase in protease resistance. New studies are starting to look at the use of dolutegravir in protease suppressed or unsuppressed individuals, and there's a protocol currently in development, ACTG A5381, to look out for. Okay, now looking at some third-line treatment outcomes. Um, this is just an overview of how A5288 enrolled, and basically the data that I showed you before, the patients that were failing their, their second-line regimen were enrolled into one of four arms. The patients that had no uh, PR resistance remained on their boosted lipinavir in cohort one, while the others were randomized into three other arms, receiving boosted um, darinavir, the second-generation um, NNRTI travarine, and NRTIs. So these were the outcomes of the A5288 um, study. We found that overall 64% of the participants achieved viral load um, suppression. Of the participants without lipinavir resistance, so the ones that stayed in cohort one that stayed on their second line regimen, they actually performed the worst in all of the different cohorts. They had less than 50% um, viral suppression. Also, they were the cohort that saw the most participants with adverse events. So it could just be due to um, uh, intolerability of the, the, the treatment regime. Very interesting also was the fact that we saw very low PI resistance in the patients that were failing, only 2% emergence of new PI drug resistance. But what the study did show was that third-line um, antiretroviral therapy regimes assigned by algorithm and containing new drugs were highly effective in participants with existing lipinavir resistance, meaning it's worth it doing a resistance test for your second-line failures so that you can choose a more optimal third-line regimen. Similar outcome data has been published on a South African third-line public sector cohort with 79% viral suppression being seen. However, in this this cohort, what was interesting was that the PR resistance to second line um, boosted lipinavir was sitting as high as 93%. Okay, so seeing the emergence of. So now looking at the potential use of second line in NRTIs in third line regimens, there is a phenotyping study that has come out um, in CROI this year that showed that Repilverine and Travarine were misclassified 30% of the times, meaning that the genotypic, the predicted resistance in the genotypic data said that, they would, that the drugs would be resistant, when in fact looking at the phenotypic data, there was still susceptibility. So conclusions from third-line outcome data is that there is no clinical indicator for resistance. The resistance profiles are divergent, and therefore there is a place for resistance testing for third-line selection. The use of next-generation NNRTIs like Etraverine requires that resistance algorithms be addressed especially for subtype C, mutations that have accumulated from first and second line may impact a third-line treatment outcome. So overall, since I've got 10 seconds left, <laughs> to achieve 90-90-90, and I know we had an awesome debate the first day, I'm going to reiterate, we need U equals U. For resistance, we need that. We need our patients to stay suppressed. <laughs> For there to be 
no replication and therefore no emergence of the virus. So we need to strive for that. Um, we need to modify our treatment strategies to keep ahead of HIV resistance. That is the, the race we're in. The level of NNRTI resistance is concerning and has prompted a very quick move to look at new first-line regimens um, using dolutegravir that will address um, this issue. More tolerable second-line regimens are needed as resistance is not always the driver for failure, although higher levels of PR resistance are emerging over time. And currently, the best third-line approach, and it's been shown, it, um, is some level of indiv individualized regimes using resistance testing and historic treatment information to guide selection. Thank you. <laughs>